There are times when the scripture reading assigned for a Sunday morning pushes so hard against the culture we live in that I approach sermon writing with fear. Fear that Jesus' teaching asks more of me than I want to give. Fear that as a preacher, I won't be able to talk honestly about the text without causing offense. Fear that bridging the gap between the values of God's kingdom and the values of the world we have to navigate outside of this building might make all of us profoundly uncomfortable. This is one of those times. So bear with me. As unlikely as it might seem, even Jesus' hardest and most challenging teachings amount to good news. If you are at all familiar with the gospel stories, then you know that Jesus did not have a reputation for politeness at the dinner table. (laughs) Though scripture records him receiving and accepting many invitations to people's homes, the meals he took part in often ended in propagation, insult, or scandal. Once, a woman of dubious reputation interrupted a fancy dinner to caress Jesus' feet with her hair. More than once, Jesus displeased his hosts by healing people on the Sabbath. Often he ate with dirty hands, feasted when the religious folks expected him to fast, and accepted party invitations that earned him savory titles like glutton and drunkard. Worst of all, he said things, blunt embarrassing things that no one wanted to hear. In our reading from Luke this morning, Jesus receives a dinner invitation from a leader of the Pharisees. Arriving early, he sits and watches as his fellow guests jostle for rank and recognition, feigning politeness while fighting for strategic spots closest to their host. After observing this drama for a while, Jesus decides to call it out. Knowing full well the social rules of his day, he shuns them and asks for a revolution. Not a revolution in arms, but a revolution in table manners. When you are invited to a banquet, he tells his fellow guests, don't focus on accruing social capital. Don't dash to the front of the line. Don't schmooze. Don't show off. Go instead and sit at the lowest place you can find. If that isn't appalling enough, Jesus then turns to his host and says, when you give a luncheon or dinner, don't invite the folks who are the life of the party. The folks who will advance your personal interests, up your social status, make you look glamorous, and return your first-class hospitality with their own. Instead, Invite those whom society deems invisible. Break bread with people who are not in your comfort zone. Offer the best seats at your table to those who will never be able to repay you. I wonder how Jesus' listeners reacted. Did they squirm? Did they clear their throats and laugh nervous laughter? Or did they openly shake their heads at Jesus' apparent naivete, his inability to understand how success, security, and upward mobility work in his cutthroat society? Did they think, what a fool this rabbi is? Who could possibly follow his advice and survive in this world? Before we think about some of the parallels between Jesus' context and ours, I want to press into the story a little bit and imagine more specifically what Jesus saw in that ancient Pharisee's home. The text tells us that the religious leaders who attended the meal were watching Jesus closely to catch him perhaps in some faux pas or heresy. But Jesus was watching closely too, seeing every move, every facial expression, every nuanced clandestine interaction. What did he see? He saw a group of people choking on anxiety. 
the pernicious secret anxiety of always having to posture, always having to strategize, always having to walk into a room, size up the competition, and adjust accordingly. The anxiety of perpetually hiding weakness and exaggerating strength in order to look good and win favor. He saw a group of people devoid of joy, generosity, and even the possibility of communion. A table where everyone was so busy social climbing that no one had the time or the bandwidth to relax, to laugh, to share, to rest, to revel in each other's company and actually savor the abundant meal their host had placed in front of them. He saw a group of people so convinced of their own merits that they could not see how their personal successes depended on the contributions and kindnesses of so many others. The families who raised them, the mentors who nurtured them, the farmers who fed them, the artisans who clothed them, the essential workers who labored for them. Convinced that they were self-made, they missed the foundational truth that they needed each other, depended on each other, could not possibly survive without the gifts, abilities, and contributions they shared with each other. He saw a group of people who had no freedom to be themselves, to lay down the exhausting burden of perfection, to be authentic and vulnerable, deeply seen and deeply known faults, warts, weaknesses, and all. Does any of this sound familiar? Would it be a leap to say that just like the dinner guests in Jesus' parable, we live in an anxious, performance-oriented culture addicted to self-promotion? A culture of influencers and personal brands, of corporate ladders, and carefully curated social media profiles. I won't presume to speak for any of you, but I know what it's like to measure my self-worth in Facebook likes. I've watched my children lose sleep and court depression to secure one more AP credit, two more extracurricular activities, three more stellar recommendation letters than their equally competitive and equally exhausted peers. I have walked into social situations where job one is to make sure that I'm dressed as well or better than the other people in the room. I've sat in meetings where only the thinnest veneer of politeness hides an ocean of frenzied schmoozing and striving. The truth is, very little in our culture rewards or supports humility. Whether we're talking entertainment, politics, sports, or even religion, we in Western cultures have an unhealthy admiration for the loudest, the biggest, the greatest. Whether we acknowledge it or not, we are known around the world for idolizing the superlative. What would happen to our global standing and our mental health, I wonder, if we shunned the words most and best? What would we have left? Regardless of the particular arena you and I find ourselves in, the classroom, the boardroom, the playing field, the internet. We are constantly under pressure to determine who is in and who is out, who will win and who will lose, who will make it into the esteemed inner circle, and who will languish unseen and unwanted at the periphery. If you've been around the block a few times, you know that this vicious game has no end because there will always be another inner circle to break into, a more exclusive brand a more elite college list, a more prestigious job, a more illustrious zip code. There will be no cap on the misery we inflict on ourselves and on each other if we decide to live out our lives like the guests in Jesus' parable. And so Jesus, out of an abundance of love, not condemnation, offers his dinner companions another way forward. Don't scramble for first place, he says. Don't lead with entitlement and arrogance. Don't assume that everyone is out to get you. 
Don't idolize competition to the point that you lose your humanity. Instead, if you're used to having the best seat in the house, give someone else a chance to sit in it. If, by virtue of your race, your gender, your sexuality, your education, your health, or your wealth, you have spent your whole life in proximity to power, let the historically powerless have their shot. If you're used to being the fastest, the smartest, the most articulate, the most valued, take a humble step back and ask how you might use these gifts to bless others who have not had the advantages you've had. If you've accrued prestige and admiration for a particular kind of righteous living, let that very arena become the sacred space where you practice humility and invite the Spirit of God more deeply into your life. If you've spent your years assuming that there is not enough to go around, dare to imagine that God's world is generous, fertile, abundant, and enough. Are we squirming yet? The hard thing about Jesus' vision for the world is that it will cost us. Though we might wish it were otherwise, God is not the guardian of our comforts. God is the great reverser of our priorities, our hierarchies, and our values. But like I said at the beginning, this is good news. God turns us inside out and upside down because God in God's vast wisdom knows that our anxious scramble for greatness will lead to nothing but more anxiety, more suspicion, more loneliness, more hatred, and more devastation. In contrast, when we find the courage to gather at Jesus' table, we actively protest the culture of upward mobility and competitiveness that surround us. There is nothing easy or straightforward about this. It requires hard work over a very long period of time. To eat and drink with God is to live in tension with the pecking orders that define our politics, our corporations, our admissions committees, our Twitter feeds. But it is what we are called to do, to humble ourselves and place our hope in a radically different kingdom. Jesus asks us to believe that our behavior at the table matters. Because it does. Where we sit speaks volumes. The invitations we offer lay bare our priorities. The people we choose to welcome reveal the stuff of our souls. So, favor the ones who cannot repay you. Prefer the poor. Choose obscurity. Do this not out of defeat, but out of bold, countercultural love. Do it because this is God's world we live in, and nothing here is ordinary. In this holy realm, the tables we set are meant for communion. The strangers we welcome at our doorsteps are angels. And the host who shows us the way forward is Jesus, whose only interest in power was to give it away. Amen.